Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning. We are going to be reading out of Colossians. You can follow along on the screen or follow along in a Bible in front of you. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. You may be seated. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike. If I haven't met you, that's probably because you've kind of new to the church. I used to work here. Uh, I don't work here anymore since January. I made a, a career change. Um, so if I haven't met you, that's probably why. And for half of you, you think I don't go here anymore because you go to the early service. So this is kind of nice that you half of you can realize that I still go to the church. I actually ran into somebody an early service person around town. They're like, so where do you go to church now? I'm like, oh, um, still, still your church. We're still, but I go happily to the 1045 service with my family. So sorry to all you early birds. You're like, gosh, my day is just wasting away right now. This 10 o'clock service. You guys are so ready to get going. So it's, it's a joy to get to be uh, with you and share from the scriptures today. We're going to find out if I still know how to teach from the Bible. Um, we'll see. Um, this wasn't quite planned either. Um, uh, I was not on the schedule to teach um, somehow. I think the last three Father's Day I've got to share the sermon, but this year uh, I wasn't on um, the, 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 the schedule. Uh, Glenn Power was supposed to teach today, so I'm Glenn's substitute teacher. So in honor of a sub, we're going to keep it light today. We're going to keep it real simple, and we're going to watch a video. Um, so we are. I'm not kidding. We're going to watch a video. Um, don't throw anything. None of you can go to the bathroom. Hold it till the end of the class. Um, and if you could just lower your expectations, because that, I mean, we, <laughs> I, I, come on, we all, when we walk in, there's a sub, it's like, sweet, sweet. So let's just have that attitude, and I think it'll go well, right? Expectations here, if I get here, we're good. Um, but yes, yeah, so Glenn was supposed to teach. If you know Glenn and Jessica Power, um, you know they're not uh, here right now. They have recently welcomed little Edley into their family. That's little Edley. It's pronounced Edley, right? I've only seen it written. I've never, okay, great. Edley. Isn't she sweet? There's Glenn, sans beard. Oh. So uh, little Edley showed up early. She was born, I think, at 32 weeks. I didn't write this down. Okay, thank you. I'm getting some nods from the moms who know. Um, 32 weeks while they're on vacation, getting a break over the coast. So she's in the NICU in Santa Maria. I think got more nods. We're doing good. Um, so she's still over there. She's not uh, strong enough, big enough to be transported here yet. So they're over there. So obviously Glenn couldn't uh, be with us today to teach. Um, but um, she is uh, doing well considering everything. She was teeny tiny and um, we've been praying for her. But she's progressing ahead of schedule, uh, Glenn said, um, getting stronger. And so we're thankful for that. We're going to keep praying for them and praying for their arrival back home. And um, so I I just want to pause right now and pray uh, for Glenn, for Jessica, for Junie, for Edley. Isn't she sweet? Goodness. The last picture I saw, she was in her little 
you know, cocoon that they had. So I'm so happy to get to see sweet little Edley. Let's, could you join me in praying as we head into the scriptures today and remember Glenn and Jessica? Father, we, we thank you for the powers, your work in their lives, Jesus, the testimony of Christ that is rich in their home. We thank you for it. And we join together as their family, Lord, appealing to you on behalf of them and Edley for life and goodness and health to flood their family today. We pray for the strength of God over Edley's body, that her little organs would develop as they should right now. We bless every person taking care of Edley today, all the nurses, all the doctors, everybody attending to her. We bless with the kingdom of God. We pray the kingdom of God would flood her hospital room today. We pray for the peace of Christ over Jessica, the peace of Christ over Glenn and Junia. We ask that peace would reign in them in the midst of chaos and uncertainty and uh, what they've been walking through. We pray for the peace of God to flood them today. And we look forward, God, to the good reports coming. We look forward to them returning home and getting to meet Edley. God, come draw near the, to them today. And we turn our hearts to you, Jesus, today, that you would um, tune us into what you're doing. We thank you for what you're up to. We do agree that this, the church is uncommon and special, and what you've gathered us into is unique. And we thank you for that. And pray that you'd build all of us up today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we, um, we're in a series called Good Ground. I've been enjoying it. Hopefully you have too. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit described in the book of Galatians 6. Um, and we are uh, doing this in order to pay attention to what God's up to right now and hopefully embody the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. As Travis pointed out in his intro to the, the series, now is a, a great time to walk in the spirit because um, the works of the flesh that the book of Galatians also describe are having a heyday at the moment. I mean, just spend a minute on social media or watching your favorite news channel and you'll notice the works of the flesh are doing A-OK. Strife, enmity, jealousy, divisions, hatred, all of it flaring up right now and some of it even being celebrated, quite honestly. And so what a perfect time for us, the, the people of Jesus, to embody the, 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 the fruit of the spirit. And John Tyson, who's a pastor in New York City, uh, connected this timeliness by pointing out the connection between the fruit of the spirit and the spirit of the age that we are uh, living amongst right now. Um, we need love in a time of selfishness joy in a time of deep despair, and our focus today, peace in a time of debilitating anxiety. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace is what we're focusing on today. I'm not going to list the other ones because that's somebody else's job, and I didn't write them down. So, um, <laughs> hey, they're tricky. Um, I got the first three. All right, so we're going to focus on peace today in a time of debilitating anxiety. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, anxiety disorders are the most common mental health disorder in the U.S., affecting nearly 32% of adults and 25% of elementary age children. This means that between you and the people to your right, and to your left, chances are one of you is struggling, battling, debilitating anxiety. Now, this is not meant to embarrass or bring any kind of shame, but just to point out we are living in a profound time in history right now. A profound time. I don't think this is just because, well, they didn't study it back then. I, I don't think so. I don't, don't think it's because we, this generation, is softer than previous generations. I don't think that's the case. We are living in a time of profound anxiety. Humans have always dealt with anxiety, always. Uh, in fact, it's kind of a helpful response when faced with danger and uncertainty. It could keep you alive. It's not a bad little response, but debilitating anxiety is relatively new on the scene. I tend to chalk it up to our instant access to information. You can almost track the rise with an anxiety with the, the usage of smartphones and social media. So just 20 years ago, not even 20 years ago, when I graduated from college, 5% um, of the population used social media. I mean, I still remember 
how stoked we were at Little Fresno Pacific University when Facebook finally let us on because kids back then, you couldn't get on Facebook unless you had a college email address, .edu. That was your entrance into Fresno or Facebook. And Fresno Pacific, we weren't exactly on the map. So uh, we were so stoked when we finally could get on. Um, I know, hard to believe. Now, uh, over 70% of people use social media actively and if you're tracking, that's a lot of growth and not a whole lot of time. Um, and I'm not so sure our human souls were meant to have instant access to all of life's tragedies and um, trends and fads. And I, I mean, on, honestly, it was hilarious. I'm working on a sermon on peace, getting just so distracted by my phone. You know, if I hit like a snag, I'm like, gosh, I don't know. I'm just going to get on my phone and just like flooded with tragedy after tragedy and drama after drama in just a short amount of time. And what happens? Ooh, I got more anxiety because wow, the world's crazy and the world's been crazy for a while, but people didn't always have access to it. And I think that's an okay thing. Cause I don't know if we could, were designed to, um, to have access to all that is happening all the time. And I suspect our increased anxiety is a result of that. We need peace in time of anxiety. Now I'm talking to you today, not as somebody who is like just really excelling in this area of peace. In fact, if I could pick from all the fruit of the spirit, half of them, I don't know, but, uh, I'd probably pick any other, anyone other than peace, Peace, you know, Travis talked about there's, there can be leading fruit in your life or lagging fruit in your life. It's singular, the fruit of the spirit. It's not like a gift. It's not like gifts of the spirit. We get kind of individually. The fruit is all ours, right? Um, but there can be leading and lagging fruit in your life. Peace, back of the line for me. Um, that's not something that I naturally walk in. Self-control, I mean, it's like, I think I was doing that before I was filled with the spirit. I mean, it's just kind of natural to me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, you guys have that, right? Uh, some of you that are like not worried about a thing and soup are just kind of naturally peaceful. Great. I'm so glad I worship with you because I need you. Uh, that's why we get together. That's why we encourage each other. That's why, I mean, you, we, we gather together so we can build each other up in areas. I'm weak, you're strong and vice versa. Um, my story of coming to Jesus is one of coming through debilitating anxiety. I was raised in a church, loving home, uh, but middle of high school, I uh, was flooded with depression and anxiety, mostly due to me trying to be good, perfect, get good grades, be liked by everyone all the time, and make sure nobody knew I was sinful. Like that was a big part because I, 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 I did, I went to church enough to know what bad things were that you shouldn't do. I was doing those things and trying to make sure people didn't know about that. And that caused quite a bit of anxiety as you might imagine. And so it comes to a head middle of high school. I'm in counseling. I'm medicated for anxiety and depression. And I don't know which way is up. I am so grateful for medicine like that. If you use medicine like that, there's no judgment or shame attached to that. Uh, I'm grateful that it calmed things down for enough for me for, for a moment to think a little bit clearer. And it was in that moment I encountered the gospel freshly, not just mentally, but experienced the gospel of grace that I was accepted, loved, uh, received by God, given the full blessing of Christ, not because of what I did or earned. And it was through a teacher uh, at Golden West. Walt, is Walt here? No, Walt is not here. She goes to this church. I happened to be her aide uh, in school. And it was in God's sovereignty. I was sitting in the back of her class, full of depression and anxiety. And she just kept feeding me the gospel slowly over time and until it finally clicked and the lights came on and I was born again. And then all my anxiety went away and I've never, ever, ever felt anxious, ever. No, that's not how the story ends. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, that was a big shock for me. I was like, yeah, I'm born again. I still need medication. What's going on? You know, and it was, it was challenging to, to wrestle through that. I'm no longer medicated for that. Um, like I said, no shame if you are. My story was that God um, uh, was able to heal my heart enough for me to cope naturally, but I still had plenty of anxiety going on. I mean, 
right now we're in the middle of a big career change in our family. And I would not describe the young house as a peaceful household at the moment. I mean, you kind of got to wake up every day with your head on a swivel. It's like, what's going to happen? It's, it's, it's chaotic and not very peaceful. So what's going on here? Um, I, I'm thinking a lot about peace because it's my story. It's what I long for still. It's something I struggle with still to this day. Um, have to work through uh, waves of anxiety and trust God to bring his peace. So today, like I said, we're going to keep it simple. Uh, we're just going to talk about what is peace, why is it important, and how do we get it? Okay, that's where we're headed. No surprises for you. No bathroom trips. Um, peace in the Bible is a rich word. It's complex. It's multifaceted. I think our current usage of the word peace is kind of uh, shrunk it a bit to, to mean something like just tranquility or the absence of conflict. And peace certainly has elements of that. Absolutely. But I'm afraid most people understand peace to be far, something that's far too cute and simple compared to how the Bible communicates what peace is. I'm old enough to remember when world peace was an excellent answer for anybody trying to impress the judges at a beauty contest or a political debate. Like if you were given one wish for humanity and you said world peace, you're just like an A plus human being. What did it mean? Nobody knew. Nobody could tell you, but it just made it sound great. And like I said, a little too cute compared to what the Bible describes. This vision falls short of the peace that God intended, I think. Because if you read the Bible, you notice that peace is not just an absence of turmoil and conflict, but the presence of wholeness and completeness. Peace is not just the absence of turmoil or conflict, but the presence of turmoil and conflict. Sorry, <laughs> I reread the line. Do you see what just happened? I told you, lower your expectations, guys. I'm reading here. Um, peace is not the absence of turmoil and conflict, but the presence of wholeness and completeness in relationship to God. It's that place where all is well. All is put together. That is what the biblical vision of peace is. The Hebrew word that's often translated as peace in our English Bibles is probably the only word you know in Hebrew. If you know one word in Hebrew, you know this word, shalom, right? Because it's used as a greeting. It's like their version of aloha. Like, is it hello or goodbye? It's both. It's awesome. It's shalom. It's a blessing of wholeness and completeness and goodness that you're wishing upon someone. Shalom. Uh, I first encountered this word when I was 22 years old. I moved to a neighborhood in Fresno called the Devil's Triangle. Uh, terrible marketing. Um, but it was nicknamed that because of its history of violence. And I moved in to participate in a residential Christian ministry internship my last year of college. My parents thought I was a little crazy. So did I. I was, it was, what am I doing here? By the time, thankfully, I moved into the neighborhood, there was at least two decades of people before me who had purposely moved to that neighborhood to bring peace, to bring shalom. One of those people was a guy named Dr. Randy White, who led the ministry I was a part of. And he did a, a little Bible study with us interns. And he was teaching from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. Love that verse. Maybe you know it, where God declares through the prophet of Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, right? Plans to prosper you, plans for your welfare, Plans to give you a hope and a future. And we were all like, oh, good. <laughs> we weren't crazy moving into this neighborhood. Some of you um, graduates probably had that written on your cards, right? A couple of weeks ago. Anybody get Jeremiah 29, 11? No, nope, we're not doing that anymore. Come on. That is just like, come on. You got to have that in your back pocket, people. Um, but then Randy backed us up a little bit into verse seven, where the word shalom first shows up in the chapter um, to, to, to help us see what we're talking about when we talk about peace. Because if you read Jap Jeremiah 29, you'll notice different versions of the Bible translate that word differently. Sometimes it's plans for your peace, plans for your welfare, plans to prosper you. Which is it? Yes, it's shalom. Well, in verse seven, the prophet, God through the prophet Jeremiah tells these people, seek the peace, seek the shalom of the city that I've sent you as, into exile. They're exiles. They're a million miles away from peace and shalom. They're in Babylon. And the prophet says, seek the shalom of the city that I've called you to as exiles for in its shalom, you'll find your shalom. 
wow, this is not just the absence of conflict. They're in the midst of conflict and turmoil. And God is saying, seek shalom, seek shalom, because in the city's shalom, you'll find your shalom. Now, I could spend a long time trying to explain shalom to you. Uh, I don't uh, have a great handle on the Hebrew language. And by not a great handle, I mean no handle on the Hebrew language. So, but you know who does is Dr. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project. He can do in three minutes what would take me like three years to explain to you. So, as promised, substitute teacher video. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. All right. I mean, honestly, I was thinking, let's just watch that three or four times and read Colossians 1 three or four times and call it a day. I mean, that's great. And I've seen that now like three times this week and new thing every time. I highly commend uh, the Bible Project to you if you're ever in, uh, in need of Bible study tools. Um, so shalom, irene, peace, multifaceted component that's just tucked right in there into the fruit of the spirit that brings total well-being to the total person, mind, heart, body, spirit, soul, like the whole person with the, the fullness and the wholeness of God. Paul, the apostle who was an expert on the Hebrew language, um, he, uh, 
certainly understood Shalom well and was clear when writing to this letter to the, 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 the church in Colossae that we read earlier, um, that the peace Shalom is Christ centered and Christ achieved. It's Christ centered and Christ achieved. I mean, he is just gushing over Jesus in this, these, this stanza. He is just so excited about who Jesus is. He's the image of the invisible God. He, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. If you could put that verse back up that we read earlier from Colossians 1. Yeah, um, he's above everything. He's the head of the church. He's just like, he's just rattling off this wonderful resume of Christ. And then at the end, he says, in him, the fullness of God was so happy, so pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Do you hear the shalom coming in? To put everything back together, whether it's in heaven or on earth. Making peace, shalom, irene, by the blood of his cross. In another letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus, Paul goes so far as to say that Jesus himself is our peace. Peace is a person. Peace is not an abstract idea in the Bible. So speaking of having an excellent uh, handle on the book of Hebrew, I also like how, um, oh, that's not good. I didn't label those. Um, I like how uh, Eugene Peterson renders these verses in the message in Colossians 1. Could you put that up as well? Um, he writes that Jesus was supreme in the beginning. Uh, this is toward the end. Supreme in the beginning, leading the resurrection parade. And he's supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there. Towering above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies. All because of his death, his blood, that was poured out, poured down from the cross. Jesus himself is our shalom, is our peace. The peace that the Bible demonstrates is Christ centered and Christ achieved from the first page to the last page of the Bible. It's not something abstract. It's not something we need to mentally understand today as much as something we need to experience from God himself It's a rich experience of God's full faced blessing to people who need that blessing of wholeness and well being. And that blessing is fully achieved, fully realized only in God's Son, Jesus. That's where just the pinnacle of peace is demonstrated in the person of Jesus. He himself is our peace. That's what peace is. Why is it important? Well, what peace is kind of answers for us why it's important, hopefully. But just in case, we're still wondering, like, I don't know. Do I need wholeness? Do I need well-being? Maybe you're kind of on the fence. You're just fully put back together. Um, I think peace is so important. Shalom is so important because currently anxiety is the norm. It's the default. It's acceptable. Busy, busy, busy. Worried, worried, worried. Hustle, hustle, hustle is all a form of anxiety. That's the norm. We need peace. And I think because we humans have a innate remembrance that this is not right. Like it's not right to live this way. See, humans were created in a place of shalom in a garden called Eden. And I think all of us have like a remembrance of that to some degree. We remember in our souls that we were meant for peace, for wholeness, for connection with God, not brokenness, not scatteredness, not disordered thinking. We were meant for that and we long for it. I mean, who could use a little bit more wholeness and completeness in their life, in their body, right? In their place of work, in your school, in your home. I think all of us could say, yeah, I could see some places that are lacking shalom that I could really use a bit more shalom. Our anxiety is symptomatic of that deeper heart condition of being distant from God. Humanity, as we get further and further from God, anxiety goes up and up and up. And we long for that place of wholeness. And I don't think things are going to get any easier anytime soon. So I think it's important that we seek to be people who are filled with the spirit, demonstrating 
the fruit of the spirit of peace. This was certainly the top of Jesus's mind as he was getting ready uh, for the end of his earthly ministry in John chapters 14 through 17, not going to read the whole thing, uh, but we have recorded his, his last words to his disciples before he was betrayed and arrested in these, this wonderful uh, speech that he's giving to him. And he opens this up with in John chapter 14, verse one, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I read that and I think, well, that's kind of comforting and kind of offensive. Did he just say, let not my heart be troubled? Like I have a say in this, excuse me. Like, have you seen my bank account? Do you even know what travel baseball is all about? Like, have you, have you been in my house? Do you know what it's like having five kids and you're saying, let not my heart be troubled as if it's up to me. Because it's all, I got 10 circumstances I could rattle off for you, Jesus, that is, is causing a lack of shalom. And he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. And then uh, in, in later in that chapter, verse 25, he says, I, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now listen to this. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. So kind of offensive, but very hopeful. Meaning, oh, I have a say in this. (laughs) I'm not a victim to my circumstances. I don't have to be consumed by the things that used to consume me or seem to consume everybody else. Let not your hearts be troubled. He says, my peace I give to you. And the good news is he doesn't give like the world gives. How does the world give gifts? The world gives things, but it tends to be conditional, tends to be temporary, tends to be superficial at best. Jesus is saying, no, the peace I give to you is unearned. The peace I give to you, the shalom I'm leaving with you is eternal. It's deep. It's abiding. I see the need for peace, for shalom desperately. It's so important. And we need the peace that he gives, not the peace that the world gives. And we need it um, in all areas of life. But certainly I think we need spiritual peace. I think we need relational peace. I think we need just an inner peace. I, I see a great need for these things. I think, first of all, we need spiritual peace. And that's what Colossians talks about. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Because at the heart of all of our anxiety is that we, by nature, are enemies of God. That's, that's how we came into this thing. We weren't pretty good people that needed a little bit of help. The Bible describes people who are not in Christ as enemies of God. Like a war is going on. There's no peace. There's no peace. And there's no law that could fix that war. There was no amount of effort that could fix that war. We needed that fixed for us from God. And I think we mostly take spiritual peace for granted. We think like, oh yeah, God will take care of that one day, but I'm going to focus on everything else. I'm going to get my body right, my schedule right, my rhythms right, like my money right. I'm going to get all these things right, but we could get all those things right and forget that at the heart is our need to be at peace with God. We know, and you, if you're far from God, you can tell it's not right. It wasn't meant to be this way. And there's a war raging in your heart because of your distance from God. This is certainly my story, trying to fix everything on the outside and ignoring the inside, the inner peace that I lacked with God. I was an enemy of him. I was in bondage to my sin, meaning I couldn't free myself. That was hopeless. And as much as I tried, I couldn't get out. And praise be to God that he made the peace through the blood of his son through the head of the church, through the preeminent one, through the one that was the firstborn of all creation, through his blood, he made peace so that I could be a friend of God, a child of God. We need spiritual peace. It's important. We also need relational peace, right? I'm hoping that there's many of us in this room that have that spiritual peace, that war has been taken care of, but Even if that is the case, we still uh, experience relational conflict 
And we were meant to be people that are to enjoy relationship with one another. Life was meant to be good with people. And we need that shalom in our relationships. If you're in conflict with somebody you're close to or you love, it's terrible. It feels like that, that, that sense that, you know, this wall is broken down or this city that was meant to be perfect is torn apart or it, there's, there's, it, it's not right. And peace is important in our relationships because we were designed for that. And Jesus himself is our peace coming to repair what is broken relationally. Inner peace is also important, meaning our hearts, like at the heart level, like, okay, I'm, I'm good with God. I'm, I'm growing in relational peace, but we also need that heart level resilience in order to make it into the things that God's calling us to do in the world, to see his kingdom extend. Like I said, things aren't getting easier. So we need hearts that are more and more built up and resilient. We need that inner sense of shalom where I'm put back together more and more and I mean, I haven't been doing this that long. I got a few more years in front of me, but so far I've figured out, oh yeah, I'm going to constantly be growing in Christ, in healing, in wholeness, in shalom until the day I die. Like it's just a part of the deal. We're always in need of more and more heart level resilience. We need that inner peace received as a gift. It's still not earned. It's still not like based on our effort or law. I mean, I love that. And the fruit of the spirit says there's no law against the fruit of the spirit because it wasn't given by law. It wasn't given by earning or trying. It was given by life, the life of the Holy Spirit, bringing more and more shalom into our lives. Shalom's not meant to be like a, uh, like a, a, an ornament on a Christmas tree that you just decorate your life with. I got peace. See, it wasn't meant to be externally decorated, but internally welling up from a, a heart that is made whole. Peace is important relationally, spiritually, and in our hearts because we need holiness and well-being there. So how do we get it? Well, simply put, sorry for the canned Sunday school answer, in Jesus. <laughs> simply put, how do we get peace? In him. I mean, did you catch in, 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 uh, Corinth, in Colossians how, and just in a little few verses, how often Paul's saying, in him, in him, in him, he is our peace. He is, you're not going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to be put together anywhere else. It's in Jesus that we find that shalom that we need. So if it's spiritual peace that you're in need of, you're an enemy of God. You can feel it. I'm far from God. I haven't, that's, I've not been, I've tried all these external things. I'm still far from him. I'm not right with him. Well, how do you receive that? How do you receive Jesus? If you're far from Jesus and you're an enemy of Jesus, I mean, you can see I've wrestled through this stuff. I, I like, this is part of my anxiety is I just overthink, you know, it's kind of like, well, if I'm an enemy of his, how can I talk to him? And it, it can get really complex. Simply put, you surrender. You surrender. That war is raging. You surrender. And you receive a justification that was not earned by you, but earned for you. You surrender. You give up. You say, okay, I quit. I quit the war. And I receive justification, meaning I'm put right with God based on Jesus's account, not my account. And you can take care of your alienation from God today. That simply by surrendering, say, okay, Jesus, I believe, I believe I receive that today. And the war's over. Doesn't mean the conflict's done. And it's not like life's going to get peachy from here on out. But the, 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 the heart of your, your lack of shalom is taken care of as you surrender and receive what Jesus earned on your behalf. Now, if you're in need of the other kinds of peace, like I'm a Christian, I'm following God, but I'm tormented and, and stirred up with all kinds of anxiety. What, what do I do? Well, in uh, later in that speech that after Jesus, you know, he gives that speech, he's arrested, he's crucified, and then he conquers death and is resurrected from the grave. And then he shows back up to these disciples who he said, I'm leaving you peace. I'm leaving you peace. And then they're, um, of course, they just watch their leader, their rabbi, their teacher be crucified. They're probably in a time of big anxiety because they think maybe there's a target on my back. This whole thing we worked for for three years is over. Probably a little bit of anxiety going in the room. And so Jesus shows up in John chapter 20, verse 19. And look what he does. What does he say? It says he shows up. This started in verse 21. It says, he says, he, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Shalom, guys. Shalom, peace. 
As the father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you are a follower of Jesus and you're still in need, you're feeling the anxiety due to that diagnosis or this relationship conflict or that amount in the bank account. If you're dealing with anxiety, receive the breath of God. Receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with them afresh today. Maybe you've never been filled with them before. And you, you, you're, you're feeling that dryness, that effort starting to try to get everything done for God. Receive the breath of God today. The, Jesus says, peace, I leave you. I don't give as the world gives. I'm giving you peace. So we're going we're gonna to respond today in uh, worship, I think, right? Yeah, worship team, you guys want to come up? We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to come to the table today. There's going to be people that would love to pray for you for any of those things. If you're in conflict with God, far from him, we would be so happy to stand with you as you pray and receive the end to the war. You receive the peace treaty purchased for you with precious blood from Jesus. The only whole human being that's ever walked this planet has bestowed on you the wholeness, shalom, peace of God on the basis of his account. We'd love to stand with you as you receive that today. Or if you need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, come up, come receive the breath of God. Again, it's not earned. It's not effort. He'd love to breathe on you and bring the peace of God over your mind and your heart and your body. We'd love to do that today. So we're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're also going to come to the table. We're going to remember this meal, the ultimate peace treaty that's ever been provided for you. I think of the the psalmist who said, you've made a feast before me. You've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What a remembrance to remember. I was an enemy of God. I was in conflict with God and he's made peace through this blood, peace through this broken body. Remember that today. And I hope you have some gratitude start bubbling up in your heart. Like this is so special that I get to be a friend of God not because of my effort and earning and all my good behavior this week, but because of precious blood, because Jesus, Jesus has made peace through his blood. So could we stand as we prepare to respond in this way? just close your eyes just just pause there's a lot said today a lot talked about but Holy Spirit we tune into you wherever we're at in the journey we tune into you Holy Spirit dial us into what the Father is saying over us today We thank you, Jesus, for your precious blood, making peace, bringing shalom. We receive that today afresh. We remember that today. And I ask for the anointing of God to be upon us today. The anointing of God. We need peace. We need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we're only three fruit deep, and we already can tell, Lord, we need you. We need your Holy Spirit. We got no chance of walking in these in this fruit without you. Come fill us afresh today. Fill us afresh today. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. 